April release of Premiere Pro 2019 is officially here with 28 new features and improvements. So grab a cup of tea, coffee, a beer or whatever your favorite beverage may be and let's see what's new. If that's your first time here, my name is Piotr Stoczyński, I'm a freelance editor and a fellow filmmaker. Cut to the Point channel is all about mastering film editing, about streamlining the editing process. Okay, without further ado, here is number one. In the help menu, you will now find system compatibility report, which will notify you about any possible system misconfiguration. It will actually show up at the launch of Premiere Pro as well, if there are any potential issues. For example, I'm running a pre-release version and it says that my graphics driver may not support CUDA 9.2. Premiere Pro works just fine for me, but I'm sure that a moment after the release is public, Nvidia will update their driver and this report won't show up anymore. System compatibility report can also be saved as a text document, which can help with troubleshooting because even if no issues are found, it captures data about your system configuration. We can add up to 10 strokes to text or shape layers in Essential Graphics panel. The color and the width of each stroke can be customized individually and we even have the ability to add stroke on per character basis. We can now adjust graphics properties for strokes, which includes settings for joints and cups. So under the edit tab there is a new range menu icon in the appearance section. So let's make it look a little bit better with round joints, because right now it looks just awful. We can also set a global behavior for these in Essential Graphics panel menu under Text Properties and Shape Properties. Another addition in Essential Graphics panel is the text background, which is much faster than creating a shape layer and pinning it to the text. We can control the color of the background, the opacity and the size. In Essential Graphics panel, we can convert text and shape layers to masks with this mask with shape or mask with text checkbox in the appearance section at the bottom. This will mask all layers below the graphic in the layer stack. We can also limit the extent of masking to a specific set of layers by using groups. Size and blur shadow parameters can be used to feather masks. One advice here. Because the order in Essential Graphics panel and in Effect Controls panel is different, it may be confusing if you use both. So I would suggest sticking with Essential Graphics panel for the purpose of working with graphics. The installation of motion graphic templates is now easier than before. We can simply drag and drop multiple motion graphic templates for Explorer or Finder directly into Essential Graphics panel. So for example, if you support me on Patreon, you get a monthly motion graphic template. And now the installation is a piece of cake. This episode was brought to you by... Yeah, I wish. <laughs> and if the motion graphic template already exists, it will bring up a dialog asking us to decide to override or cancel. However, for motion graphic templates, I still think it's best to use Manage Additional Folders feature, because this way Premiere Pro automatically adds new templates that you drop to those folders. If you are connected to Creative Cloud, then all the free fonts will be automatically synchronized when opening the project or adding the motion graphic template to the timeline. Goodbye dialog box asking me if I want to synchronize fonts I have access to, which was always an obvious choice. A huge time saver is a new menu item, replace fonts in projects. Thanks to it, we can replace fonts for all open projects with a few clicks. If there is a font in the project that Premiere Pro cannot synchronize, you now have the ability to set a default replacement font in the Preferences under Graphics tab. It's good to have breaks when studying, so that's what we're doing right now. Like with editing, if you don't want to bore your audience to death, you need to have some variety in the tempo. So, want a chocolate? I could eat about a million and a half of these. My friend always said a new release of Premiere Pro is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. This is a very comfortable button. Seriously though, I think that Premiere is a great piece of software. I know that some of your comments will be like, what about bugs? Adobe should focus on stability before they release new features, etc. And I do agree with it, but to give them credit, with this release they also have listed 103 bug fixes. Not bad, but it doesn't mean that it will be robust for you, because there are many factors that have to come into place. 
For me, on my six-year-old PC, this version works fine and I didn't have any crash so far. But if stable workflow is something you struggle with, I have an ebook that may help you. Still, I'm sure there are bugs that I haven't encountered myself that you may run into, so just beware of the fact. And if you know the movie I paraphrased, let me know in the comments. Let's move on with the next update. If you track a mask, the live preview will be now turned off by default and it's supposed to make tracking twice as fast as before. Another thing that is making tracking faster in this release is a downscale for large frames. Basically it means that the tracker won't use all of the pixels for tracking, for example for 4K footage. They said that the accuracy is more or less the same, but the speed improvement is very significant. For example for Windows, tracking 4K footage is 12 times faster. A new SDK from RED is now integrated. It means faster RED footage decoding on Mac using Metal Renderer. Another technical update, the playback performance for 8-bit and 10-bit HEVC files has been improved. By the way, don't worry, still very good features ahead of us. 32-bit AIFF audio support is restored after it was lost due to 32-bit QuickTime deprecation. This one I really waited for. We finally have the ability to move, copy and reorder effects in Audio Track Mixer. By default, within a track we move it and with Ctrl or Command on Mac we can copy. And conversely, when moving an effect between tracks, the default is to copy and with Ctrl or Command we will perform the move of the effect. The ducking parameter has been added to ambience section in Essential Sound Panel, so now we can automatically duck ambience under dialog. When there is no embedded LUT for a red clip, we can now select an external LUT to be used. If there is already a referenced LUT, we can browse to select a different one instead and replace it, and we can always easily go back to the original LUT or to the no file state. In sequence settings, we now have a checkbox to choose between proportional and absolute scaling for motion effects when changing sequence size. Basically, it means that if for some reason you want to change a sequence size from let's say 1080p to 720p, everything can be scaled proportionally to the new sequence size. You may not know that there is a feature in Premiere Pro that replaces a clip with a rendered version without manual importing etc. It's called Render and Replace and originally it was designed for After Effects dynamic compositions that may not play back smoothly. Now there is a new Include Video Effects checkbox in that feature that gives you the option to also render all effects applied to the clip in Premiere Pro. Beware though, if you check it on, the render effects cannot be moved or edited any longer. Here are supported sources for this feature and effects that are being rendered with it. Bear in mind that any master effects or source settings will be rendered regardless of include video effect setting. If you use project locking, which is a feature designed for editors working on shared storage environment, autosave will now add user's name to autosaved project file. That way it's easier to tell who created each autosave file. Short break before we move to the third exciting part of the video. Have you ever had a situation like this with a client or a boss? Let me know down in the comments. There is a new view item added to the main menu. Most of the options here can be found in other places in Premiere Pro, but for example there is a newly added guide templates option. We also have items like show rulers and show guides, which leads me to the next very awaited update. Finally we can add and edit guides in program monitor panel like in Photoshop or After Effects. And we have the possibility to snap graphic objects to guides. We can add guides in precise coordinates in the Add Guide and Edit Guide dialog. The color of the guide can be customized there as well. There are two new buttons added to transport controls to toggle Show Rulers and Show Guides. We can also save custom guides and share them with others to use in Premiere Pro or After Effects by exporting them as a .guides file which is stored in user's profile. We can even assign keyboard shortcuts to edit guides faster, so really this is a very nice feature to have. Performance for multi-GPUs, including eGPUs, has been improved. It provides faster rendering, especially with professional codecs like, for example, Apple ProRes. 
Freeform view can be activated in project panel next to the icon and list view. I think this is the most important feature of this release and actually I made a full video about this feature so be sure to watch it next. Generally it allows you to move and organize thumbnails into custom layout which is not restricted by any kind of grid or sort order like the other two views. When zooming in and out in this view the relation and spacing between thumbnails are maintained. We can place clips in stacks, hover over them to preview the ones that overlap each other or mark in and out points like in the icon view. We can cycle through all clips in the stack, snap one clip to the edge of another and pan in the view with a hand tool. Also, when we right click we can choose clip size. In freeform view options we can specify which information is being displayed under the thumbnails. And what's really nice, we can save a freeform layout as a preset. Again, more details about that feature together with a commentary on how we can utilize it in the dedicated video. Up to this day, Premiere Pro only queried the app language when loading the shortcuts file. But with this version, Premiere Pro also queries the keyboard language. This should fix a problem for non-English keyboards that couldn't use certain keyboard shortcuts. For example, I think this is the case for the shortcut that gets rid of that program bar at the top. They added the ability to create project view presets. It saves information about which metadata columns are visible in the list view, as well as the rearrangement from left to right and other piece of display information in the panel. Moreover, in the Manage Saved View Presets dialog, we can even set keyboard shortcuts that can be mapped to those presets in the shortcut mapper. Also, to manage metadata display information, we now need to use project panel menu, which is in my opinion the more intuitive way than the previous state. So that's good. <laughs> Some improvements have been made to caption export settings. To be honest, in my opinion, the captions in Premiere Pro are the least reliable feature. So hopefully, together with extended export settings, their stability has been improved as well. Thumbnails loading in media browser panel is now faster than before. They prioritized the display of clips that are currently in the view. Previously the thumbnails were loaded from the top to the bottom. So for example loading for H.264 in 1080p is supposed to be 11 times faster. And HEVC in 4K should be about 2 times faster than before. Premiere Pro will now automatically replace individual frames that have decode errors by using adjacent frames that have decoded successfully. Previously the code errors were rendered as red frames, which if overlooked could end up on air. Now it will replace these frames with the ones that have been decoded correctly. And you will be warned by a message in the events panel. Frame replacement is limited to 5 consecutive decode errors. But if there will be more or the first frame of the clip will have decode errors, then it will be replaced with a black frame, which makes more sense than a red one, right? Now that you know about all of these new features, watch the dedicated video about freeform view or about a new mind-blowing addition to After Effects which lets you remove literally anything you want from the shot. So hit that sub button, a bell icon and see you there.